We do welcome you to our worship service this afternoon. Visitors, it's lovely to have you with us and may you be blessed and encouraged as we will be as we hear God's word come to us. Just in terms of the calling process for Deacon, uh, this morning the outcome of that is that brothers Buta and Holtzlag have been called to the office of Deacon. Again, we're very grateful to have Brother Andrew Miller lead us in worship this afternoon and uh, there is no song of preparation. As we come to worship our God, shall we consider these words from Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4, reading from verse 12. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from, its, from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. That's the opportunity that we have as we've gathered to worship our God this evening. Shall we commit this time to him in a moment of personal and silent prayer? Amen. Shall we stand and receive the Lord's greeting? Well, brothers and sisters, we are those who confess that our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And our God greets us, saying to us grace and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, his Son, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's sing together number 362, Blessed Jesus at Your Word.
and as we remain standing, we will confess together our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. It's on page six in the front of the hymnal. So, with the church of all ages, shall we say with heart and voice, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, I believe a holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And we'll sing from the Psalms, Psalm 139, uh, the first three verses, and then verse 12. Shall we come before God in a time of congregational prayer? Father God, we come before you and adore you and praise you. You are the God who rules over all, the God who made all things and sustains all things. You are the God who knows all things, the God who planned the events of history and the God who controls all that might come in the future. You know it all, and you have worked it all out so that your love, your goodness, might be known by us. And we look to your Son and know that he came at just the right time, in your time, that he might redeem your people. And we praise you for the good news that has come to us uh, in your grace. We praise your name for opening our eyes to your gospel and indeed for opening the eyes and hearts of many others down through the ages. 
and you have promised to continue doing that. That you will, for all time, keep a people close to your word. And so we pray that your kingdom would come, that your kingdom would advance, that the hearts of many would be one for you. We pray that your glory would be over all the earth. And as we wait for that great day, the last day that you have told us is coming, as we wait for all the glories of heaven itself, help us as we serve you in bringing your gospel. Lead us in ways that honour you, our great shepherd. Bless us with your spirit that we might serve faithfully, that we might follow in obedience, follow after Christ. And we give you thanks for uh, this church here, uh, this fellowship, uh, for the facilities that we have, for those who, who serve in various capacities. We give you thanks for the, for the elders and the deacons. And we pray that you would strengthen those that uh, have been elected to office today. Strengthen those men that they might be equipped to serve uh, here as deacons. We pray for the management committee, uh, for the musicians, uh, for the people that look after uh, the bulletin and uh, all the various things that happen to maintain the life of the church. We thank you for them and we pray for those who willingly serve in these ways. We give you thanks for, for friendship and community, uh, for the common bond and a common mission to be your people, to, to bring your word. We give you thanks for, for unity and we pray that you would strengthen us in that unity. Where there is trouble or strife, we pray that you would give us the grace to, to work that through. And where there is joy and celebration, give us the grace to rejoice with those who rejoice. We, uh, we pray that you would strengthen uh, this church here in this time of vacancy. Be with them as they seek to be with us as we seek to uh, find a man to, to serve uh, as the minister here. We, uh, we pray that uh, the, the, the calling committee, those that are, uh, are seeking that man out, that their work might be blessed, that, that uh, the man of your choosing would, would come. We, uh, we give you thanks for the way that you have provided uh, during this time. And... Uh, we pray that uh, you would um, bless the work of those that have served uh, in, this, in the church here during this time of vacancy. We, uh, we, we think of other churches as well who are vacant and we, we pray that you would be near to them also, that uh, they may be encouraged as they remain faithful in trusting themselves as, as we all do, in trusting themselves to your word and to uh, the great promises that we find in it. Bless our families, be near to parents, be near to uh, our children. Uh, watch over our older folk, we pray. Give them the strength that they need for each day. And we know that our world uh, is changing quickly. We live in a world of, of fast changes, rapid changes, many changes in many levels, and we Pray particularly for our young people in that environment, that they, that they might be preserved, that they might be protected, that they might not be wound up and, and lost in, uh, in, the, in the way that the, the direction that the world is going. We uh, entrust them to you. Give them the, the courage and the confidence that they need that uh, when they face opposition, uh, they will... Uh, Rely on what they have learned as truth. Protect them and guard them, we pray. And uh, we ask that uh, you would um, give us all that we need, all that we need each day. Uh, be with the breadwinners, we pray as well, those that work and support families. Uh, be with them in their workplaces. We pray for uh, the mission works that, the, that our churches support, particularly the work in Papua New Guinea, um, we pray for, for that work as they, um, as they need more resources there and uh, we pray for them as they uh, continue to, to seek to fill the positions there 
uh, and we pray that uh, the work that they do, training ministers, might be, that might be blessed. Well, we think of our world, we think of uh, those Christians who face persecution uh, in the form of uh, losses to their liberty, even the, the threat of losing their lives or, or uh, suffering uh, the loss of ones they love. We pray that you would strengthen them in their resolve to, to follow after you and to, to love others as you have taught us to love. It cannot be easy to, to uh, truly be your people uh, in, a persecuted, uh, in a persecuted world, to, to love uh, enemies of the faith. We, we pray uh, for your grace and we thank you for that example uh, that in them the world might uh, see that followers of Christ uh, are radically different. Indeed, we pray that that might be true in our lives as well, that uh, we bring a, a, an attitude and a hope that a, a, a desperate world needs very much, that needs more than it could even imagine. Protect your people in the faith, that uh, we might stand firm and in so doing uh, use your people in every circumstance to bring glory to your almighty name. Uh, be with us now as we continue in this worship. Uh, be with us as we bring our offerings, as we open your word, as we sing your praises. Uh, renew us, revive us uh, through it all. And may all that we do be pleasing in your sight. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to uh, the elder, Andy's going to lead uh, us in the Bible reading now uh, from Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 through 39. And after that uh, Bible reading, our offering will be collected. Right, let's turn to the book of Hebrews. In page 1007, I think, in your Pew Bible. So we'll pick up Hebrews chapter 10 at verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great, high, a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment, and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with suffering, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come, and not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. 
and if he shrinks back, my soul has no, pre no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Let us come to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we, we come before you and give you thanks for all that you have blessed us with. Lord, thank you that we may gather and worship, that we may gather and bring um, an offering to you. Lord, may it be done out of jo thankfulness and much joy for what you have done for us. Lord, may we not only bring this money, but present our entire lives to you in service. Lord, may your kingdom come and may we be instruments in service of helping your kingdom uh, come. Lord, we pray that you will come and may, we may be ready in serving in that kingdom. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together number 372, Lord, your word shall guide us. text for our sermon uh, this evening is 1 Kings chapter 13. So please turn with me to 1 Kings 13. It's quite a long story 
and I'm sure I can read it for you. Um, it's an interesting story. Uh, the title of uh, the sermon this evening is What Will Define You? What Will Define You? And as I mentioned, this is our text, 1 Kings 13. And behold, a man of God came out of Judah by the word of the Lord to Bethel. Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make offerings. And the man cried against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and he shall sac sacrifice on you the priests of the high places who make offerings on you, and human bones shall be burned on you. And he gave a sign that same day, saying, This is the sign that the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be torn down, and the ashes that are on it shall be poured out. And when the king heard the saying of the man of God, he cried out against that the, the man of God cried out against the altar at Bethel. Jeroboam stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, "Seize him!" And his hand, which he stretched out against him, dried up, so that he could not draw it back to himself. The altar was also torn down, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign that the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king said to the man of God, Entreat now the favour of the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me. And the man of God entreated the Lord and the king's hand was restored to him and became as it was before. And the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself and I will give you a reward. And the man of God said to the king, if you give me half your house, I will not go in with you, and I will not eat bread or drink water in this place. For so was it commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall neither eat bread nor drink water nor return by the way that you came. So he went another way and did not return by the way that he came to Bethel. Now, an old prophet lived in Bethel. And his sons came and told him all that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. They also told to their father the words that he had spoken to the king. And their father said to them, which way did he go? And his son showed him the way that the man of God who came from Judah had gone. And he said to his sons, saddle the donkeys for me. So they saddled the donkey for him and mounted it. And he mounted it, and he went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. And he said to him, Are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. And then he said to him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with you or go in with you, neither will I eat bread nor drink water with you in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, you shall neither eat bread nor drink water there nor return by the way that you came. And he said to him, I also am a prophet as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord saying, bring him back with you into your house that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him. So he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. And as they sat at the table, the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. And he cried to the man of God who came from Judah, Thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the command that the Lord your God commanded you, but have come back and have eaten bread and drunk water in the place of which he said to you, Eat no bread and drink no water, your body shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. And after he had eaten bread and drunk, he saddled the donkey for the prophet whom he had brought back. And as he went away, a lion met him on the road and killed him. And his body was thrown in the road, and the donkey stood beside it. The lion also stood beside the body. And behold, men passed by and saw the body throw it in the road and the lion standing by the body. And they came and told it in the city where the old prophet lived. And when the prophet who had brought him back from the way heard of it, he said, It is the man of God who disobeyed the word of the Lord. 
Therefore the Lord has given him to the lion which has torn him and killed him according to the word that the Lord spoke to him. And he said to his sons, Saddle the donkey for me. And they saddled it. And he went and found his body thrown in the road and the donkey and the lion standing beside the body. The lion had not eaten the body nor torn the donkey. And the prophet took up the body of the man of God and laid it on the donkey and brought it back to the city to mourn and bury him. And he laid the body in his own grave. And they mourned over him saying, Alas, my brother. And after he had buried him, he said to his sons, When I die, bury me in the grave in which the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. For the saying that he called out by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places that are in the cities of Samaria shall surely come to pass. After this thing, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way, but made priests for the high places again from among the people, any who would be ordained to priests of the high places. And this thing became sin to the house of Jeroboam, so as to cut it off and to destroy it from the face of the earth. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, in our Lord Jesus Christ, we have read this intriguing story of the man of God who comes to speak the word of God to a wicked king. And by the end of the story, the man of God who brought the word of God boldly is dead. He is buried in a tomb that was not his own and the wicked king continues on in his wickedness. And like me, you might read this story and feel its importance, but struggle to work out just exactly what it is telling us. There is much to digest in this story. And it has been fashioned in quite a remarkable way. It is a story that is placed in our Bibles right at the centre of the account we have of King Jeroboam. King Jeroboam was the first king of Israel, the first king after the people of God divided into two nations, Judah in the south, maintaining the heritage of King David and the line of the Davidic kings, and Israel, or Samaria, in the north, a new nation led by Jeroboam. And if you know the story, you will recall that Jerob Jeroboam came to power after leading a rebellion against Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. And in placing this story, as they have, right in the centre of Jeroboam's account, the original authors are telling us that this account is Jeroboam's defining moment. And in the telling... This story, only ex uh, this story only exposes Jeroboam and the people of Israel. It not only exposes them, but it exposes uh, all people of all time. It exposes us all in the folly of setting aside the word of God, the word of the Lord. Nine times... The word of the Lord, that exact phrase, is mentioned in this passage. Everyone, that's Jeroboam, the two prophets, the altar, the lion and the donkey, everything is subject to the word of the Lord. And as we think on this story, many questions pop up and go unanswered so that the word of the Lord might be the heart of of the story, the focus of the story, the real hero in the story. And it is also helpful for us to remember the reason the two books of Kings were written. They were written for a people in exile, a grieving people. The people of Israel and Judah had been taken into captivity and the glory days of Solomon were long gone. Why did things go so badly? 
Why were they suffering? Where did they go wrong? And so the writers were tracing back through history to answer these questions. And as the story flips between the two kingdoms, between uh, the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom, the reason becomes very clear. The reason for their failure becomes very clear. And that is this. When you forsake the word of the Lord, when you despise his mercy, there is nothing left for you but the bitterness of judgment. And perhaps that's why the two prophets in our story go unnamed. Un as unnamed prophets, they represent the people of that age. And they also serve to forewarn us all. It's not safe to depart from the word of the Lord. Fidelity to the word of the Lord is a must, personally, and even for us as a nation. Neglect the word of the Lord and the hand of the Lord is against you. As Hebrews 10 tells us, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. One of the things we see used in this account, and we see it in many parts of the Bible, is irony. The passage uses irony to illustrate and emphasise key parts of the story. And with the time that we have, we're going to explore this passage by looking at, at three of the ironies it portrays first uh, for us. The first is this. Uh, the notion that the, that the word of the Lord has no authority. See, as our story begins, we have Jeroboam standing at his new altar... He had led a political uh, revolution. And as we can read in the previous chapter, fear of losing his authority had quickly uh, led him to turn a political revolt into a religious one as well. And so he made two altars, one in Dan and one in Bethel. And he said to the people, let's make worship easy. Let's make it convenient. Let's change things up a bit and let's do it my way. And what should he bring out? But, and you've heard this before, we've seen these before, what should he bring out? Golden calves. Perhaps that's ironic in itself. That's happened before in Israel's history. And it didn't end well, did it? Golden calves. And this brave man of God from Judah comes with the word of the Lord and he stands before this newly appointed king at the height of his powers in a crowd of adoring worshippers. He really makes a scene. He disrupts proceedings and he speaks against the altar and he brings a message of judgment. The altar and the form of worship Jeroboam had created was wrong. God doesn't like it. Despite there now being two nations, there was still only one way to worship God. The altar in Jerusalem was the only way. God, has, God had prescribed the form that his worship should take. One altar, not three. And priests from the house of Levi, not priests appointed by a king who in effect had made himself the centre of their worship. And the message, a king from the line of David, Josiah, will pull this false worship apart, destroy it, desecrate it. God will not allow it to stand the test of time. And to end any confusion, the truth was confirmed before Jeroboam and all the people as the altar split apart and the ashes poured out of it. There was no doubt about the message that the prophet bore that day. Indeed, there was no doubt about the key message all true prophets bring. God's word is clear. 
There is only one way, and that's God's way. And all attempts to do otherwise will not end well. And the irony we see is this. The new king, Jeroboam, raises his arm against the man of God from Judah, uh, his arm that represents his authority and power, and he shouts, seize that man. I'm the boss. This man is ruining my day. I have the power. Take him down. But his arm, his power, dries up so that he cannot move it. Jeroboam, your power, your authority is subject to God. No matter how you try and shut this man up, the word he bears is the authority here. In fact, God's word always was and always will be the ultimate authority. It is protected by God because it comes from God. It is his truth and he is truth. And Jeroboam makes his heart known to all. Pray to your God that my arm might be restored. See, he says, he says, your God. Jeroboam had distanced himself from the living God. And we see that in our world today, don't we? People hear God's truth and they shout, shut that man up, seize that man. People don't want to know, but then at the same time, uh, just at, the, at the same time, just as there are no atheists in foxholes, I don't want to know him. But I want my problem sorted. And Jeroboam prays, uh, and the man of God prays for Jeroboam, and the Jeroboam experiences mercy. His arm is restored. Now, what a picture that is. The message is clear. Jeroboam, the living God, is not happy. Your authority is nothing compared to his. Any authority you have is given by him. Repent, Jeroboam. He restored your arm and he will show you mercy. Repent, change your ways. But there is no repentance. There is no thanks. Intimidation didn't work. And so Jeroboam, before all the people, tries to harness the power the man of God seems to have. He says, come home with me and I will reward you. And so it is that we learn that the man of God had not only a word to speak, but also a word to keep. Verse 8, if you give me half your house, I will not go in with you and I will not eat bread or drink water in this place for so was, so was it commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall neither eat bread nor drink water nor return by the way that you came. And that leads us to a second irony we want to explore. The word of God, the word of God, obedience to it doesn't matter at all. Before Jeroboam, the man of God's faithfulness, in both word and action, is exemplary. He speaks boldly and he heads for home. He acts wisely. He has said and done exactly what the Lord has told him to do. But then there is this horrible twist. An old prophet living in Bethel goes after the man of God and lies to him. I also am a prophet as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord saying, bring him back with you into your house that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him. So he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. And as they ate and drank, a true word came to that old prophet and the irony is played out. The man of God who spoke the word of God against disobedience had the word of God spoken against him. Judgment came against him for his disobedience. He was not excused from keeping the word of the Lord just because he had spoken so bravely and acted so wisely earlier in that day. He was not excused because someone lied to him. He wasn't excused because he was hungry or tired or thirsty. 
He was tested and he failed and judgment came swiftly. He headed home and a lion struck him down. And in case anyone was tempted to think that this was just a poor stroke of luck, the lion and the man of God's donkey stood together by the corpse. Now, I don't think anyone would argue that this was impossible. Lions kill to eat. And there's no way a donkey is going to hang around with a lion. The lion neither ate the dead man nor tried to dine out on the donkey. He did his job. He killed the man and that was it. And the donkey was either very loyal to the man of God or it too was obeying the instructions of its creator. You see, all of this was a definite sign that this thing was from God and those that saw it that day certainly saw it in that way. It's a humbling account. Now let's ask ourselves, where did that man go wrong? You might say, well, it's just not fair. He was lied to. If punishment was due, surely the old prophet, the liar, he's the one. He's the one that had it coming. Well, the story is largely silent on all of this. But what we do know is that the old prophet spent the rest of his days with blood on his hands. The true word of God he spoke forced his confession. He had to acknowledge his lie. And his lying became public knowledge. But the, but the focus, at least in this part of the story, is very much on the man of God from Judah and his actions. You see, this man had the true word of God and it was a very simple word and a very simple command. He spoke it to Jeroboam. He even repeated it to the old prophet. But then he chose a different way. He was disobedient. When he stuck to the word of God, he was safe. When he left it, his fate was sealed. And you might think a death sentence was harsh, but just think, how else could have all of this ended? If the man of God was disobedient and then let off the hook, what kind of message would that send to all who heard this story? That God's warnings or God's commands are not always important? That they don't always apply? That the word that this man had spoken earlier in the day came from a God who is inconsistent? Or a God who has favourites? These things are just not true of God. God is the same yesterday, today and forever. God's favour rests on all who turn to him in faith. He has no favourites, but he is just. The warning the man of God brought against Jeroboam's altars was a warning to all men. The death, the man of God, God died, this too is a warning to all men. And so it is that we see that the man of God must be a man of the word of God or else he becomes a man of the world with deadly results. If you have the word of the Lord and understand what it says and say, never mind, I'll go my own way, we will not do it, obedience is optional, you are in a very dangerous place. Indeed. Hebrews 4 verse 12, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And if we somehow think that the word of God only sometimes applies, or perhaps we can just pick and choose, perhaps it's a word that we, that we need to play with, and uh, a word that we need to dress up a bit. Well, as one man said, you, can, you cannot cut and paste the word of God. If you do that, 
You are not in danger of losing it. You have lost it already. So let's be reminded again. What is this word we are to keep? What is it? Well, it's ten clear, simple things, isn't it? You shall have no other gods. You shall not worship any other gods. You shall not misuse God's name. Keep the Sabbath. Honour your father and mother. Do not lie. Do not steal, murder, do not commit adultery, do not covet. And we know how necessary this is. But the devil, the father of lies, works very hard every day to undermine the keeping of this word. If he can't intimidate us, if he can't co-opt us, he will work to corrupt us. And that corruption inevitably begins with a lie and the hardest lies to resist come from those wolves dressed as sheep Jesus himself taught us that Matthew 7 verse 15 beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves brothers and sisters we need to know that we are in the middle of a spiritual battle And the devil uses all his powers to bring his lies into the church. Will you take the bait when he offers you an easier way or a new approach? Will you listen to the modern thinking, the soft approach of compromise and making it simple? The man of God did. But you see... God has given us the means, the instructions on how to defeat the attacks of the devil. We have this clear word of the Lord. We have a God who never changes and a God who never contradicts himself. Are we going to learn from the man of God who never made it home? When you are faced with something new or something different, are you going to make sure it's right? Are we going to be like the Bereans in Acts 17 who searched the scriptures to know if things taught were indeed truth? And if we don't do that, if we don't arm ourselves, arm ourselves with the word, the sword of the spirit, if we are not ready to battle against things that we find very appealing, we may well find ourselves eating nice meals, with nice people, only to find we are eating death and then feeding it to our children. Caught on the wrong side of irony. Measure, test, evaluate everything against Scripture. You might think you're immune, but His glory is at stake. Be safe. Like it or not, His word will judge us all. Well, this brings us to the last piece of irony we want to look at. And that's the idea that the word of the Lord offers no hope at all. There's no doubt that the old prophet had made some serious compromises in his life. What was a prophet doing living in Bethel? And why wasn't he up there that day speaking against the altar? If you have a look at uh, 2 Chronicles 11, you you would conclude that this prophet had chosen to live in this place when all God-fearing people had moved away, moved south, back to the Davidic kings. This prophet had made peace with his surroundings and he had his burial plot all sorted up on the hill at Bethel where Jeroboam's prophets and priests would be buried. And he lied. Prophets don't lie. He had decided that there was something else, another way to make a future for himself. He had pinned his hopes on something other than the word of God. But in the end, the irony is that he honours the man of God. He confirms the word the man of God brought and he even testifies to the fact that it is 
in the word of God that we find our only hope. In verse 31, when I die, bury me in the grave in which the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones for the saying that he called out by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places that are in the cities of Samaria. Big sentence. Shall surely come to pass. Lay my bones beside his bones. My bones won't be safe anywhere else. I have aligned myself with him. Ironic, isn't it, that this story should end in this way. The man of God is dead, but his word does not die. It's a word of true hope. And so a prophet from the south and a prophet from the north speak against Jeroboam's idolatry that day. And indeed, this irony deepens. Jeroboam is set in his ways. Despite everything that happened that day, all the warnings, he goes on living for today, living for himself. That's what people do when they have no future, isn't it? Life becomes all about today, what they can get out of it. It becomes all about self-gratification and feeding their ego. Their hope is their belly. Jeroboam just carries on. He rebuilds his altar and appoints his own priests and the fate of his new nation is sealed. They were torn to pieces by the Assyrians about 300 years later and they never recovered. And the prophecy from the man of God came to pass. Josiah King of Judah comes, not long after the Assyrian invasion. You can read about that in 2 Kings 23. And in verse 15 of that chapter we read, The altar at Bethel, the high place erected by Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, that altar with the high place he pulled down and burned, reducing it to dust. He also burned the Asherah. And as... Josiah turned, he saw the tombs there on the mount and he sent and took the bones out of the tombs and burned them on the altar and defiled it according to the word of the Lord that the man of God proclaimed who had predicted these things. And then he said, what is that monument that I see? And the men of the city told him, it is the tomb of the man of God who came from Judah and predicted these things that you have done against the altar at Bethel. And he said, let him be. Let no man move his bones. So they let his bones alone with the bones of the prophet who came out of Samaria. You see the irony? For all those years, 300 years, as the people carried on in their own way, up on the hill at Bethel, there was a monument, clearly visible and clearly known, right in their midst. A monument speaking against wickedness and speaking uh, that true word of hope that a reformation would happen, that God would destroy what Jeroboam's sin had created, that God would heal his people. In fact, that's what the name Josiah means. God restores or God heals. Josiah, a king in the line of David, would come with God's authority and put an end to all this wickedness. A king in the line of David is coming to make all things right. Now that sounds like a hope you and I can very much relate to, doesn't it? Are you waiting for a king to come to make all things right? Are you waiting for a king to come and heal this messed up world? Indeed, just as Josiah broke down all these false altars and destroyed the false religion, 
Jesus, the Davidic king, has come and defeated all the powers of darkness. Defeated them all in his once for all sacrifice. The ultimate irony. The irony of the cross. Victory and life eternal through death and sacrifice. And that one way to God, as preached by the man of God, the altar in Jerusalem, a pointer fulfilled through this great act, the greatest act in human history, the demonstration of the depths and riches of God's love for you and me in the death of that one man on the cross. Jesus. He is the only way to God. The Word who became flesh. And today, no matter how dark the world around us is, we live in His light, knowing that this King is coming again, knowing that His justice will prevail. Now that, brothers and sisters, is a true hope the only future worth trusting in. Like the man of God, do you speak boldly for the Lord only to fall when you are tested? Or are you more like the old prophet? Have you made or do you make compromises with the hopelessness of the Jeroboams of this world? We need to heed the warnings from this passage. Don't be defined by disobedience. Repent and know that in your sin, God has not forgotten you. Indeed, it is when we sin that God calls out to us, there is a better way. That's what the monument did there in Bethel for the people of Israel. And just as Josiah made sure that that monument stood when everything else around it was destroyed, we can know today that no matter how hard the world tries to shut that word up, they labour against it in vain. It is there on the bookshelf in most homes around our towns. And it's there in our cities as the cross stands tall on the roof of many churches. But will it be found in the most important place? In the living and the loving of your life? Will it be seen in the obedience and steadfastness of his people? By God's grace it is and it will be. By God's grace we will be defined as those who hold to the absolute authority of the word of God who cling to it and uphold it, who obey it. We will be defined as those who look to the living word as our only hope. And it is a living word. Became a man like us in every way, the true prophet who speaks the very word of God, the high priest who laid down his life, the ultimate sacrifice, a ransom for many, and having been raised from the dead, the eternal king, All power and authority has been given to him and he rules and empowers a chosen people, drawing them by faith, unifying us in the faith, making us whole by his word and spirit. Indeed, as the last verse of Hebrew 10 says, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Shall we pray? Father God, we give you thanks that in your word you so powerfully confirm the power and truth of your word. As you did in the days of Jeroboam and even more amazingly demonstrated in the person and work of Jesus Christ, our prophet, priest and king, Remind us of the danger that is always present. That if we should uh, defy your word or neglect to test whatever comes our way, using your word as our standard, we ask that you would renew us in in our 
determination to keep your word foremost in our lives. And may we uh, be a people who in the midst of uh, challenges, the challenges we face in the, word, in the world, uh, that we might be people who uh, may defend and preserve that word, not in our strength, but in his strength. May, we, uh, may it be true for us that we may be known as a people committed and holding fast to your word. We give you thanks for uh, today and the opportunity to worship you in the way that we have and we pray for your ongoing blessing in the week ahead. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, let's stand and sing together number 505, Be Thou My Vision. from the end of Jude as our benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time 
and now and forever. Amen. Let's sing 368.